better. So, so uh, again, thank you, thank you very much for uh, for having me here, and uh, uh, thanks to University Lab Partners. Um, so again, that was a complicated question. Let me um, let me break it down into a couple of pieces. Re research as a service. This, this is the. Um, uh, I, I was at, when I first started as, as um, chief science officer at, at Chalk Children's, which isn't, seems like a long time ago now, but it's only four months. Um, the, the question came up of, uh, it, it's sort of a question one wouldn't ask. It, it's hospitals, academic hospitals do research, they're associated re with research, but I wanted to back up and ask the general question, well, why? Um, because if you think about it, the mission of a hospital is, is healthcare. Um, universities do research, the hospitals, can do research, but it's not their primary mission. And, and often you will see that um, when a hospital does start to try to do research, they will do so by, uh, uh, they will build a building and they will fill it with researchers. And, and some of those researchers may be on staff as clinicians, but many of them aren't. And, and having accomplished that, then they say, okay, we now have, we're now an academic hospital because we do research and that's what academics do. But if you think about it, academic hospital itself is a bit of an oxymoron. How could a hospital be academic? Academic is about an academy. Um, it's, about, it's about learning and teaching and, and, and research and scholarship. Um, nobody graduates uh, with a degree from a hospital. Uh, nobody's a professor at a, at a hospital. Hospitals will train medical students, but they are not medical schools. They may be affiliated with medical schools. Um, and hospitals certainly aren't about doing research. They're about treating patients. So um, the question is, why, why would a, a hospital uh, try to do something like that? And um, the, the, uh, um, so, so the question then is, well, of course we need research. It, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very important for, for learning and for advancement in, in science in general. And, and so um, we use it, we use research. And when you ask different people, what does research mean to them in a hospital? What does it come from? And we did this, we had a, uh, a strategic planning meeting at the end of February to look at this and ask lots of people this, this question. You get different answers from different people. So if you ask a, a, a physician, uh, why do they want research? Well, we, research is what allows us to, uh, to develop new, new, uh, new therapies and to test these therapies. And, and, this allow, and, and it comes under lots of headings such as evidence-based medicine or personalized medicine. But the idea is that there are uh, the, the ability to, to make progress, of course, clearly depends on research. But if you ask patients or, or the parents, uh, what research means. Uh, you get different kinds of ideas. You'll, you'll, get, you'll get an answer that research is hope. Uh, there may not be a, a treatment for, uh, and again, I'm going to be very pediatric centered, but uh, there may not be a treatment for my child now, but hopefully there will be in the future, and, and the research is what's going to give us that hope. And one of the other concepts that emerged from that, and I, I particularly heard this from a, um, uh, a parent whose child had, had died, uh, was that research gives meaning because when your child participates in, in research, even if they themselves don't survive or, or are not immediately helped by that, their participation in the research allows them to contribute to the health of other children. And that's a very important way in which sometimes meaning can be given to an otherwise uh, sort of uh, meaningless uh, series of, of sometimes tragic events. And, and so, um, and, and then from the point of view of the hospital, maybe the administration, research can give you uh, uh, sort of bearing in, your, in the community, it increases your standing, you're seen as an, an whatever an academic hospital is. But in the end, research becomes a support service for clinical care. Uh, it supports the, the decision processes of, of clinicians. Uh, medicine is fundamentally about decision making, and you need you need information to support decision making. So, so research provides the the essential support for decision making, um, and, and again provides sort of hope and, and meaning in some cases to uh, the patients who may benefit from that research or who may uh, be be participating in it. Um, but at the end of the day, a hospital is not a uh, is not a university, uh, and and it doesn't have the facilities of a university. Uh, if you just you walk onto a university campus, what you see are students, and you see uh, uh, support for students, and you see dorms, and you see lecture halls, and and uh, and and laboratories, and and all the all the things that that go into a university. Um, 
that no no uh, hospital can create at that same kind of scale. You can create little miniature universities, but uh, universities survive because of their scale, because there's enough students uh, to support the work of the faculty. Uh, the faculty research depends on students, and and uh, it doesn't. And I'm not talking about medical students. I'm talking about graduate students. Medical students have have lots of things they need to do with that, which have nothing to do with research. So so. Uh, uh, my laboratory uh, in the electrical engineering department, I have students and postdocs, and um, they do the research. If it wasn't for them, uh, nothing would happen because as, as the principal investigator, I have very limited time to actually be in the lab myself uh, doing that work. So, so progress happens because of this, this army of, of students who are uh, being educated at the same time as they are are, are participating in, in the research that, that drives the questions forward, and then they will go out, and then and some of them will, will go into research as well, and they will continue that, that process. And again, that's really not the mission of a hospital, but a hospital can benefit from that. So I think it's important to, to recognize the, the differences in what, how research is done and mission. The mission of an academic institution is, is teaching, and, and expansion of knowledge, discovery of new knowledge. The mission of a hospital is healthcare. Discovery of knowledge is important for that, but uh, um, it's not the primary mission. That becomes a mission and service. So that's the idea that research is a service. So now the second part of your question was, what does this look like? What does an academic hospital look like? And I would say um, the simple answer to that is I don't know because we're trying to figure this out. But this is the question I would like to ask. I know what it has looked like in the past. The academic hospital of the past looks like a hospital with a research building across the street. And, and when you walk into that hospital, if the research building weren't across the street, the hospital wouldn't look that much different. And, and some hospitals will, will have more clinical trials, um, but clinical trials will happen in non-academic hospitals as well. Uh, there, there's, um, it, it's, or hospitals that don't consider themselves strongly academic. Um, and, and, so, and many hospitals that are, do consider themselves strongly academic, many of their patients are not involved in any kind of research. Um, and so you don't feel it. The hospital looks the same. And so the question I've sort of wondered about is what would it look like? What would it feel like to walk into a hospital where you felt that they were learning from every patient, where, where you feel as, as if uh, you, you walk in, you bring your child in, and you as a parent and that child, you have a unique experience. You have an experience of, your, uh, of, of fighting this disease. You have an experience of knowing the symptoms in a way that only somebody who either has the symptoms or lives with someone with those symptoms can possibly have. And the symptoms are much more complicated and nuanced than you would ever read in a textbook. So there's, and, and, and no, no two patients are the same, even with identical genetic diseases. And, and so we, we, we learn over time that it's those differences that matter. And, and again, what happens, what does it feel like if you feel like at the same time as your child is being treated for something, your child is contributing to the treatment of, of other children? What does it feel like if you walk in and, and there's always a question being asked. We're, we're pretty sure this is the right thing to do, but we're not 100% sure. Do you mind if we take this extra sample and that will help us to figure out maybe even for your child what we can do different? Or suppose you walk in and say, there is no cure for this disease that your child has, but we have a laboratory here that could try to figure it out right now. So that there's a sense of uh, different scale of research. And, and maybe you could imagine uh, dividing research into sort of global research, epidemiological research. We're going to look statistically at, at just observations and correlations, and a lot of that is uh, a very important part of the data science and data mining that we can now do on, on the large data sets that are available. Um, and then you can have clinical trials where you may have a randomized clinical trial of an intervention. And again, it's a statistical outcome. We take uh, a bunch of uh, subjects who we think are approximately similar to each other in some way, and we give them an intervention that we think is approximately the same intervention for say half of them. And then we do something different or a placebo that we think is approximately the same for the other. When I say approximately, two people take a drug, it's not absorbed the same way. And placebo itself has effects. I'm a neurologist and placebos release dopamine. So placebos are not, everything has an effect. You're just comparing two different effects. And those thing, effects will be different on different people. So you take a group of people that approximately match and you do a couple of interventions that approximately match. And then you do your statistical outcomes and you'll get some answer. 
Um, and then someone comes into your clinic uh, and, and they say, you know, if I give this drug to my child, will it work? And uh, the outcome of the study might be an answer like, well, there's a 70% chance it will work. But of course, that's false. The, the chance is either 100% or zero. You just don't know which. Um, and so the, the clinical trial does tell you there's an effect because there might not have been an effect at all. And so the, if there is an effect, you can prove there's a high likelihood that there is some some biological effects. And of course, you can look for adverse outcomes and complications and interactions, and there's lots of reasons to do this. But that's what I would call sort of statistical medicine. And the statistical medicine is uh, often co-identified with the word evidence-based medicine, but there's many different types of evidence. And, and I say, what would it look like if you went to an auto mechanic and they said, well, statistically, uh, what makes cars not run is, is that the battery uh, often is run down, so I'm going to replace your battery. And you say, well, how about you just test the battery? And I'm like, well, we don't have to do that because this is evidence-based. And, and so you imagine that that's kind of where we are in a lot of medicine, except that we're not. That's not that doesn't really happen because that's why we have clinicians. That's why the doctors and nurses and people who, 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 who treat patients look at the patient. That's why we do an examination. That's why we don't let computers uh, make these decisions, because we look and we listen and we talk to people and we get the information. Um, but, and, and, but eventually, you want to get to the point where the, you do this much more personalized form of research, which is you say, let's try this in you. We're going to have an outcome measure. We're going to give you this medicine and see if your headaches get better, and you're going to uh, uh, keep track of those headaches. So we're going to give you a different medicine, and you're going to keep track of that. And we're going to compare these and do statistics on you and, and see if it makes a difference for, for you. And that's a different kind of, of research, but it's nevertheless research. Uh, it doesn't really have a name. Uh, sometimes we call it N of one research. Um, it's not the same thing as personalized medicine, which is a term that has been co-opted for uh, uh, genetics, um, and, but it has the same intent of saying, can we, can we examine something about uh, your child in particular? And that's not to say that, that detailed examination of someone's genome is, is not helpful, but remember that the genome is the assembly instructions and a little bit of the operating instructions, but tells you very little about, about what the actual structure is at this moment, uh, because of course that was developed over time with influences of both genetics and the environment. So, so the, uh, the genetic component is an, is an important uh, element that can help to differentiate and make predictions, but it's not the same thing as looking. It would, it would be as if I tried to, again, uh, fix your car uh, by looking at the uh, by looking only at, at the the technical specifications of a car or or a list of the parts, um, sure I can look at the list of the parts and if this car has a different set of parts than that car that's certainly helpful to know. But at the end you have to figure out which one's broken, <laughs> and so uh, um, that that is again you 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 have to look at those specific aspects. So I think that when you think about the types of research and what it looks like. There's the use of the sort of more global statistical research. And then there's the use of research where you, you take measurements and you have outcome measures that apply to individual patients. So I think what a, what a research or an academic hospital of the future would look like is something that recognizes both of those. That is simultaneously looking at, at the statistics, which could be using data science to actively mine into their own databases and, and, and make predictions from that. And those databases might include genomic and radiographic and, and uh, uh, other types of historical data. Um, but, but that we're also, uh, you have a, a, sort of, a sort of a thinking laboratory where, where you, can, uh, you can take particular questions about particular children and try to feed that back when you need it. You don't always need that. If you come in with an ear infection, we'll treat your ear infection. But if you come in with a brain tumor, uh, we might want to know a whole lot about your brain tumor. And, and this is where I think that the true advances in many of these things will happen because, again, the brain tumors are going to be very unique and, and will have very different susceptibilities to different types of treatments. And under those circumstances, you might want to test that particular child's brain tumor, or you might want to test a particular medication uh, that, that may modulate the immune system in a model of that child's immune system. So you can imagine ways in which that would, that would pervade the hospital environment. And, and so, um, you know, I think it's a very long answer to your question, but this is, this is very much the, the kind of image I have for what, a, what the future of academic medicine means, which is that we, are, we, are act, we, we partner with the academy, uh, we are not an academy, we partner with the academy, but we also use research thinking 
to try to answer the clinical questions, to make the decisions that will actually, that will end up helping our patients. And I, I think it needs to be done in a way, if you do this right, I think that will be very obvious to the patients that are part of the system and they will feel that the hospital is acting towards them in a, in a very, very different way. And I would just add, if you can hear me, is my voice coming through? Um, <laughs> excellent. Um, that was a, such an amazing, um, thorough answer to that question, Terry. Um, uh, I, I was just going to add, it creates a virtuous cycle, too, where the patient's seeing that their uh, needs are being addressed uh, in that way, at that level, and that they're con you know, contributing uh, to their care, and they're really being listened to. They'll want to help. They'll, they're, they're in it. Um, um, with with um, a positive hope and motivation, um, and I'll just you know uh, pick up on a couple of uh, items because you know I'm very much at the interface between the academy and the hospital. Um, and in fact, uh, my first startup was a was a research department in a community hospital where uh, I was able to. Um, get research uh, going because I brought in engineering students and um, the docs and the clinicians, uh, the allied professionals, everyone said we need more of these students to keep our uh, projects going and to take on new projects. And this is part of um, uh, Dr. Sanger's response as well. I just wanted to chip those in. Um, and this is something um, we, uh, I look forward to doing both with uh, definitely in connection with, with chalk and uh, the UCI um, system as a whole. There are a lot of great components to work with to begin with. I'm very excited. Um, and, uh, and I was off to such a fast start in the month and a half before the month and a half that I've been at home. Um, so um, I'm looking forward uh, to, to coming back. Uh, um, uh, and one of my uh, sort of quick start um, items was working with the SBDC, and it's great to have them literally across the hall from where my office is at the Cove, um, and the people in the Cove working in different groups, um, how those pieces fit together. Um, I'm looking forward to tying that uh, into the medical system at UCI, uh, uh, building on past uh, links and um, and finding new ones. Um, I was wondering uh, there, I, whether, Terry, you want to say a little bit more um, about some of the big sort of picture initiatives or um, uh, themes that you see in, for, in the future for chalk. Uh, I guess. Um, well, one of the things that, that uh, it becomes a, uh, an immediate problem if you want to have a, a hospital where everybody participates in research is that's a lot of research. There, there's a lot of patients coming in. And, and uh, if, if every ch child who comes in for their outpatient visit, um, it has an option of being in a couple of different research trials, like, how do you do that? What, what's, how, how do you actually make people? And so I, I think one of the themes is thinking about how do we, uh, how do we engage outside partners in, in running these research studies? In other words, we can't as a hospital, we can run some of them and we have many things, but, but the question is who, who's actually doing the work? Um, as, and then, and this, this will be a little bit different if you're testing pharmaceuticals versus if you're testing devices or you're looking at data science, there, there may be different different kinds of pieces to it. Um, but I, I think you do want to think hard about what it looks like to, like what questions do you want to answer and who's going to ans answer those questions. Um, so one of the, when, when you think about, let me, let me take this from point of view of devices and, and uh, George, you and I have been involved for, for many years on the, uh, the health technology engineering uh, program that we created up at USC. Um, which was a, um, a program where we brought together uh, engineers, uh, graduate students in engineering and medical students in project teams over a period of four years 
uh, to develop some kind of technology or some kind of device. And, and uh, over that period of time, they would, uh, many of them would try to create companies, have some kind of even publications, get awards, and, and they did. And, and in fact, I, I think at some point we'd won like all the innovation awards at, at, at USC were being won by our students. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and there's certainly a lot of that, that, um, that same kind of flavor already in existence at UCI, and I think a lot of your job is, is uh, uh, to find these things, pull them together, and, and point them toward children, and, and so that's, uh, that's, that's going to be a, a big uh, part of it. But because of that, I, I think we have, uh, for many years, thought very hard about devices. So let me talk about one of the things that I'm very interested in doing in, in the process of devices. So when you, when you think about uh, device innovation. Um, I, I, learned, I learned this through the biodesign program at Stanford. Before I came to USC, I taught at Stanford for, for nine years. Um, and and uh, Paul Yock and Josh McHower there were creating the biodesign program while I was there. And um, I, was, I had the, uh, the, the pleasure and the privilege to be involved in the early design of that program and to be one of the, uh, one of the faculty in it from early on. And, and uh, I think that was um, one of the things that I was really struck with was the design thinking process. And, and what that really came to is this idea that um, if you're trying to solve a problem, there, there's sort of, there, there's many ways to solve a problem. And there's a real tendency among uh, researchers and engineers to come up with a solution. It is a good one. And so I'm going to run with it. It's going to work. It's good. You know? um, but the reality is, if you don't know if it's the best, it could be a good one. And why would you work on the second or third best one? So that the one of the uh, concepts in biodesign is you're supposed to come up with a list of you know, maybe 300 needs of opportunities, narrow that down to the top 10, uh, test those, pick the top three, and work on all three of those until you figure out which one is best, and you do the top one. So the idea is that it, it becomes a sort of selection process. And, and what you're selecting on is, is things like, What's the likelihood of success? What's the potential impact? Uh, um, you know, is this a long-term sort of blue sky project or a short-term sort of low-hanging fruit? And, and you kind of try to uh, prioritize these in some way and you use the, those as, as metrics to decide what you're going to work on. And, and one of the things that I, I really took away from that was this idea that um, there are many things you could work on and, and many things that could work. Um, but you, you use this process to ask not just what's the right device for this problem, but is this even the right problem? And, and uh, we in the HTE program taught a lot of the concept of sort of let's back up. What's the real problem you're trying to ask? What are the potential solutions to that problem? Which could be anything from uh, sort of a public health solution down to a particular device to an educational program. There may be many ways to solve different problems. And so some of them are cheap and some of them are expensive. And uh, you know, on, on uh, the, the nature of the problem and what your funding source is, uh, you, you may be somewhat limited or biased or different types of solutions, and, that, and that's, that's fine. Um, and also what problems to work on. And, uh, um, and the idea is that the problems kind of compete with each other, and, and, uh, but you only have so much time, so you've got to pick the right one. You've got to move forward with that. And so we spend a lot of time teaching that, uh, that concept. And I think one of the things that's interesting is that that concept doesn't, doesn't show up very much uh, when people within a hospital start to identify problems. So uh, someone will say, you know, I, I have, uh, I need this. Can someone build it for me? And maybe someone comes along and says, yes, we can build it for you. And they build it, they get these prototypes. And then they say, well, we've got this thing and it works. Why, why can't we get any investors? Right? Why, why, can't, why can't I push this, this company forward, right? And, and then you can have uh, uh, excellent groups that will, that will consult. And they'll tell you why. They'll say, okay, there's a regulatory problem. There's a reimbursement problem here. No one's going to pay for it. There's not a big enough market. Um, they'll tell you all the reasons why that thing won't work. And then you kind of reject it. And then you sort of try to come up with, with the next idea. And it's very hard for people because often the, the, the clinicians, we will say, but we need this. You know, th this is a useful thing. And, and what I point out to the students is that may be true. And, 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 and they'll even say it's a useful thing and there's a business model. Like it's, it's not that expensive to make. You know, I can build it for $20, I can sell it for $50, they're easy to make, you know, and, and uh, um, you know, we can sell 10,000 of these a year. And, uh, and I say, well, look, think about this from the point of view of the person you're asking for money, your angel investors who's go, who are gonna look there. And they say, that's fine, you know, they, they, they like it, it's good. But right after you comes somebody else who can build a product for $1, sell it for $100, and sell 100,000 of those a year. So which one are they gonna fund? 
So, so their money, like your time, is, is a finite resource, and they're going to put it into the best thing. So just the fact that something works and is useful doesn't mean it's the best thing or the most useful thing. So, um, and one of the things that, that happens I see a lot in research is that people don't apply this kind of thinking to research. So, so in, the, in the device design space, people are getting used to this. They, they've been taught this, this sort of Palo Alto model, fail early, fail, you know, try to, try to uh, predict the future failures so that you don't spend a lot of time working on things. It's, it's an evaluative process. You, you think, okay, let's, let's make my list. I can evaluate all of them, let's let, and we'll, we'll, we'll sort of assign them a score and, and move forward. So if you don't do that, uh, you're a researcher, and this happens, I see this all the time, uh, um, I sit on NIH study sections, and it's very clear that what happens is someone says, oh, I've got good pilot data, I should write a grant. And then they do, because the pilot data look good, and then they write the grant, and, and you know, if they're lucky, it doesn't get funded, and if they're unlucky, it does get funded, because now they're like, oh my God, I didn't really want to do that, <laughs> you know, but I have good pilot data, and so it was convincing, and the study section funded them. Now, this is the NIH. You don't randomly get funded for things you didn't really want to do, but the point is that you, you, you might have worked on just because you can doesn't mean you should, and, and, and so I, I think injecting this kind of design thinking into the, the research model would be very helpful. We talk a lot about uh, bench to bedside research with the idea being that somehow a, a, a researcher uh, will, will come up with an idea and they'll do the science. And then uh, the missing piece is sort of getting the science back to the bedside. So let's get that piece there, right? But if you were looking at from an innovation standpoint or a design standpoint, you say, well, why does the bench, meaning the scientist in a bench laboratory, why do they know what needs to be worked on? I mean, where do they get this from? You know, they Google it. I mean, it's, you know, what, what's the, what's the, how do you know you've got a friend, you know, you know somebody who once had a child who had this disease that looked really bad, let me work on that, right? Um, so where did that come from? Or I just happen to be interested in this area, what diseases in that area might be relevant? And then there's the obligatory first few paragraphs of any NIH grant that describes, you know, the health impact of the thing you want to do, but you don't really understand any of that, all you understand is your science. And, and so, you know, I think there's this, this component of a design piece that ends up being missing, where you say, okay, what, what do we want to work on from a science point of view? And, and you want to think all the way through from what will have health impact and, and what ultimately is going to be, and, and what's the way to do it, right? So you say, okay, I need, I need to solve this problem. I, I have a, uh, um, you know, patients are getting confused about uh, which medicine they're supposed to take on what day. Um, so I'm going to build an artificial intelligence, you know, vision-based thing that can, that can look at the pills and figure out what they are and shine lasers on them and, you know, etch them with the right numbers and, you know, beep your cell phone and your smartwatch or whatever it is when you need to take the medicine. You could do that, right? Uh, or you could just find a better way to print labels on the bottles, right? I mean, you could, you know, you, you could imagine that there could be many solutions to these, these problems of varying level of, com of complexity. And, and you, you want to, but it was a real problem, right? It, is it the most pressing problem is the next thing you have to ask. So I, I don't think the bench is where you, you decide those things. The bedside is where you decide those things. So what you really want is sort of bedside to bedside research, right? You want research that is, is guided by the actual needs. So as I said before, medicine is a decision process. It's you're trying to make the best next decision. That's all you need to do. There's, and if there's no decision to be made, you don't need the information. You know, you, it's, it's wonderful to have full exome sequencing. It's wonderful to know all these genes. But if I don't have a medicine that treats the disorder you've got, it, the, that information essentially doesn't help me very much. It may allow me to not do other tests. But, but often it doesn't, it doesn't have, have direct effect. So there, there are situations where you have to ask, okay, what, what are the pieces of information you need? What are the decisions that need to be made? What are the interventions you absolutely need? And I think that really starts at the bedside. So I, I think the idea is to think about injecting this, way, this design way of thinking and this innovative way of thinking, the, 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 the way in which we think about devices and innovation, in, inject that into the decision-making process for what science do we want to do? So what, what kind of science have you? And, and so again, long answer to your question, but how do I, what's the, the biggest thing I want to do is, is change the nature of that decision process. The 
um, we, I don't want to just do science. I want to do impactful science. If a hospital is going to do science and it's science in the service of healthcare, it should serve healthcare. It's not science in the service of academia. We're not, you know, publishing papers and getting grants and giving presentations isn't what you want. You want science that makes children better. And, and so you need to think very hard at every step of the process. Do we need this? And what impact will it have? It also means that the impacts tend to not be financial. And, and this is a, a, another topic, but one of the things that I think you and I had a lot of experience with, the, uh, uh, with, with uh, Children's LA, and we see it at, at Children's of Orange County as well, um, pediatric research, well, pediatric products almost never make as much money as their adult counterpoints. So, uh, counterparts, so that if, your, uh, if a financial return on investment is your, your metric of success, uh, you will always choose the adult product over the child product. Um, so, but if impact for children is your metric of, of successful outcome, then you're going to choose the child product. But those things don't line up. They often do line up in adults, right? It, it's a, a successful adult medical product often will uh, have, have good financial returns so that they, they do kind of line up. But the point is in pediatrics, it almost never lines up. So you have to think differently about how you would engage uh, how, how you engage corporate partners and finan finance, financing partners in, in, uh, in the development of, of pediatric devices. But um, let, me, let me stop for a second and pass, the, pass this, this back to you, George, about the question like what, from what, um, you know, from our experience in HTE, um, how do you see bringing that experience into UCI at this point and how, what are the opportunities for, for this sort of uh, technology development, design development between, between, in the partnership between UCI and, and uh, Children's Orange County? A lot of it um, uh, connects with your last statements about um, impactful uh, work, impactful innovation that uh, doesn't have to, you know, have a 100x return to investors. Um, and, you know, we can point to, uh, I think it's important to point to examples even within industry you know, if, if, if it were up to uh, HP, they probably wouldn't uh, produce Braille um, keyboards, right? I mean, they're, they're not making much money off, they're probably losing money off of uh, Braille keyboards, but it's the right thing to do. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that um, we, you know, can, we have some of the sort of the regulatory and policy pieces in place to support innovation products for kids where uh, and this is an ongoing attempt through uh, um, the consortium for technology innovation and pediatrics uh, based out of C chla the local one there are five across the country but all of these um, ways to uh, focus on you know what's the right thing to do um, and how do we enable people to come up with solutions that um, are, are focused on uh, uh, patient-based needs. Um, and then, you know, first and foremost, um, and then innovate in a way that there's more likely local uptake at least, and then sort of decide from there um, and work with partners to um, sustain the local uptake and also to facilitate where it's meaningful uh, to test what kind of variants uh, or variations are needed on that technology so it can deploy, be successfully sort of um, launched in different sort of health systems, ecosystems, different geographies. Um, and uh, that could work through a consortium of children's hospitals. And, and we have links now that um, are, are growing and uh, coming into Chalk, we, we know we're connected to a, a broader network, um, the, uh, I spy network, uh, and we're continually building these links. Um, so the other piece that I would add is the funding isn't always from, you know, angel investors, seed fund investors, VCs. There's also very strongly motivated uh, foundations that uh, want to make a difference. Uh, you know, um, so um, whether it's the um, uh, Chan Zuckerberg. Uh, uh, foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. There, uh, I come from a background too, where I was in a disease-focused inflammatory bowel disease research network, and so we look for funding, and we 
we really did among that. So the, the funders become the parents of ki uh, children or the siblings, family members of people who know, you know, with your research, I know um, there's some symptom alleviation for my family member, but I'm also seeing the potential for a cure down the road. And we, and that justifies my uh, really sort of um, relentless um, efforts to raise money for, for causes too. And, and, and we, uh, especially in the children's um, research area and innovation area, we, we have, you know, many generous donors and highly motivated people who want to help us help um, um, innovators make a difference in the lives of their um, affected uh, populations. And, and even and this, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to a question <laughs> that you've touched on genomics uh, and personalizing responses. And now one of the things that we're at the cusp of is uh, having enough information from the genome and then the, the, as you described it, the separate, the additional layers, the epigenetic, the environmental uh, effects over time um, and the, you know, how the, how your blueprint is transcribed and the sort of the, the ruts uh, or the, the sort of the pathways that um, uh, come into play. And we're, we're really sort of at a point where we can use that um, to inform patient care too. Um, yeah, and I, that, I think, I think yeah. you're right. <laughs> so I'm just sorry, keep going, I apologize. Oh, I was just, uh, uh, I was just gonna say, and, and it's just, there, that requires, and one of the things that we learned over and over again, and we, 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 you know, how it really requires a team to innovate, to do research. And these teams are getting larger and they need new members in the sense that there are certain skill sets that we don't have enough of, or um, we have to be open to uh, different perspectives. That's another aspect of uh, design thinking that, um, uh, that, you know, showed itself in, in so many ways in, in the different uh, generations of students, some of whom are, are sending us text messages in the chat, by the way. <laughs> yes. No, I, I, I think so. I mean, it, it's, um, yeah, it, you, there is, there's a lot of need for collaboration. And, and I agree with that. And then certainly, you know, we've heard that from many, many sites. One of the interesting places where I think perhaps um, the need for collaboration or, or cooperation may not have been recognized as much. And this is one of the things that I, that is uh, very important to me to build at, at Chalk, um, is the, um, the link between research, innovation, and data science. Um, these are not, neither research, innovation, nor data science are the goals of hospitals, but these are important services that are provided. And they're not dissimilar to each other. So you mentioned genomics. So I, I think in the very near future, uh, many of, of our patients will have whole, whole exome or whole, whole genome sequences, and that's well, a couple gigabytes worth of data. And, uh, um, and, and the medical record is not designed to store this stuff. But we have an example. There, there's a predicate for this, which is the storage of, uh, uh, of imaging data, which can be many gigabytes per, per child of imaging data, uh, particularly when there's MRIs and other 3D imaging or any kind of video imaging associated. And, and so you can imagine uh, a day in the very near future when uh, in addition to the, the uh, radiology databases, there's also a genomic database for the hospital. And these things are all sort of linked and searchable in some way. And, and this is very, I mean, we all complain about the interoperability of these things, but these are solvable problems and, and uh, they are being solved by people, including here. Um, and and I, I think as, as we pull this information together, the data science becomes very powerful because it allows you to do, again, the, the sort of epidemiologic studies, like let's, let's just figure out uh, you know, which, what, what in your genome predicts a response to this medication. That would be a, a reasonable sort of epidemiologic study. But it would also allow you to say, uh, your child comes in, let's match them against this database. And we're gonna match them in terms of history. So maybe natural language processing on your, uh, uh, your dictation is gonna be matched against the natural language processing on the dictations of everyone else in the hospital. What are, what are the symptoms? You can match them on, on genomic data. You can match them on radiologic data. Does your you know, sinus film or your chest X-ray or your MRI, uh, who does it look like? 
and and then you can say okay you you have a match with these children here are the here's the range of discharge diagnoses here's the probabilities it doesn't give you an answer but it might give you it, it's an important support tool and so now by the time you get to see the neurologist uh we have all of this background information we still have to do the exam but even that as you do the exam you say oh wait a minute the reflexes are elevated in it goes wait a minute that's going to narrow down the set of possibilities again you're never going to substitute for the statistical signal processing ability of the human brain it's we're just that we're just really good at this this is what we do we're good at it we train at it no problem but it doesn't mean that we can't but what we can't do is we can't mine the same amount of data we're very good at learning quickly from small amounts of data it's something that computers currently are not very good at computers are very good at learning slowly and now with ever increasing speed from very large amounts of data so it's a good partnership and and so data science as a science but also as the sort of the end of one support for clinical decision making i think is going to become more and more important and and there's so data science is important research is important innovation is important if you do we have uh, uh anthony chang created the medical innovation uh and, and medical intelligence innovation institute uh which is a uh a, a way in which we can we can think hard about innovations in in a pediatric uh environment and and uh, and, and think about the links to how, to how we can have companies work with us to do research so at some point you're we're going to have a uh uh, we have these companies coming in or we have devices or products that we're looking at which go through sort of a pipeline of evaluation. But once you have decided based on design principles what it is you're going to make, you have to test it and that's, that's research. And once you do the research, you, have to, you need to look at the data that comes out of that, that's data science. So, so science, innovation, data are all linked very, very closely. They're, they're not the same thing, but they're very closely linked. And I think one of the things that's important to recognize is that that becomes, you, you have three different ways of thinking. The, what, what it is that constitutes sort of not really truth, but, but logic in these things is very different, right? It, it's uh, science is uh, hypothesis driven research. We have a hypothesis. We're going to try to figure out if it works. Data science is, is often uh, mining for data, looking for patterns, often it's not hypothesis based. And that's one of the things that drives scientists bananas, but that doesn't mean you can't find interesting stuff, even in non hypothesis based uh, uh, sort of correlation based research on, on, on these data, data streams. But, uh, and just because of the sheer volume of data available, you may be able to make very important uh, inferences. And innovation is, is not about any of those things. It's about, you know, can I make something useful and, and does it have, in, in this case, health impact? Um, so all of, so those ways of thinking come together. Those ways of thinking are also informed by medicine, which doesn't share any of those things. Like I said, medicine is about, uh, I need to make a decision. Like what, I, I need information, what are the decisions available to me? What information do I need to make the, to make the next decision in that process, right? Um, and, and then you know, all, of these, all of these fields have, have different ways. Engineering has a very different thing. You know, engineers, I say engineers understand things only when they can build them. Scientists understand things only when they can predict them. And doctors never really pretend to understand things. We just want to make it better, right? So, so the, the, the point is, but, these, but think about the differences of those ways of thinking, which are the correct ways of thinking for those fields. These things have developed over hundreds or thousands of years and, and you put them together. And, and now you can create something, something better. But I think you have to recognize the differences before you can, you can start to, to look at how you, you pull that. And this, is, this becomes an important thing for, for teaching. Um, and like I say, one of the things that had happened with the HTE program was very much a training program, trying to create students who could see these different perspectives. And we spent a lot of time on the psychology of that. Um, and, and I don't, I'm not sure yet what this is gonna look like at UCI and Chalk. Um, but I think I, but I am curious about, you know, as, as we start to do this, if you had some more thoughts on, on that, like how do we involve students in becoming the glue that helps to pull together uh, the, these different ways of thinking? Well, um, having students at home now is making that question more difficult. <laughs> um, I do know that there, one of the things that uh, I've been impressed by at UCI so far, there are different um, groups that, um, help students look at different non sort of non-traditional um, uh, careers as a result of their education. So there's, you know, uh, um, uh, so I think I, I'm, I'm learning from, from that. I think um, the, in, in, there are programs that exist now that are growing. Uh, the bio engine program is a senior capstone program that was 
formerly just for biomedical engineers, and I have to give um, uh, Michelle Kine and Christine King uh, credit for creating an excellent program that um, teams students um, with clinicians who have, uh, uh, have specified uh, challenges, needs, issues to focus their efforts on. Uh, I think um, one of the things that the students uh, of the Health Technology and Engineering program at USC, when they graduated and went on to different residencies, they say, George, where, where can I get, get more of this? I'm looking forward to creating opportunities at UC Irvine to create more of that for medical students, not that they would have to, as you, as you said earlier, they're very busy, especially in, as residents, but there, there will be an opportunity for them to supervise um, postdocs, graduate students at different labs that are doing really, um, uh, doing the kind of research that can be sort of mildly sort of deviated from its uh, normal direction in to, to support um, or to find solutions or to enable some of those solutions um, that are possible out of the design thinking uh, process. So do we have people who can actually do some of this and let's link them and see um, how much more the appetite on the clinic, the clinician side will grow saying, you know, uh, can we have more of these students or more of these uh, experts or grow, uh, budding experts, let's just say. Um, and, the other piece that's in place at UCA that I'm excited to be part of is, um, you know, programs like the i program, where we do have um, science mentors who have students who have more of an entrep entrepreneurial urge. I'm looking to sort of um, bring that over a little bit more to the ICTS program, so their clinicians and trainees are aware of it, um, so that they can work, not so that they have to become an entrepreneur start their own company no they know um, to be part of a team to, to engage in a dialogue to facilitate those things and that's we have that um, literally upstairs at ULP from <laughs> in the, uh, on the third floor from where I'm at um, where you know we have way wayfinder people in the in the in the bull pit uh, on the second floor there and then we have companies in the spaces on the side. And I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, um, in my little fishbowl office there so I can see that and sort of, and, 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 and intercept people that I um, know will be helpful to um, begin to help me um, get more details on the answer to that question that you just asked me, Terry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with, um, with that, I want to make sure that we reserve enough time. It's about four o'clock right now. So we're getting quite um, some interesting questions for the both of you in our um, Q&A box. So I'd like to make sure we reserve time for that. So first and foremost from um, Chris Wagner, a normal attendee at OC Life. Um, do clinicians at Chalk have dedicated time for research? Or is it an extra activity beyond their normal scope of, you know, clinical duties? Um, well, it depends on the person, right? I mean, some people, it, it's there's different types of positions. A clinician scientist might have negotiated uh, what might be considered protected time for research. Um, but I think more of the question is, what's the right model for this? One of the things that I, I, I've said to many people, uh, people will frequently come and ask me, they say, we need protected time. I want 20% 20 protect, 20 protected time, 30% protected time to do research. And what protected time means is that instead of using 20% of your time to generate clinical revenue, you're going to not generate revenue for 20% of your time, but we still have to pay your salary. Nobody's saying I, I'm, I want to go to, you know, you, you're feel free to reduce my salary by 20% so I can do research, right? Which they could because, you know, researchers do get paid less, so it is possible, but that's not what I'm being asked. Um, and, and so then the question comes up, well, what does 20% of your time cost? Decisions tend to be expensive. Pediatricians perhaps less than their adult counterpoint parts, but we're still expensive. Um, and uh, we spend a lot of time training to do things that are reasonably esoteric. So, Using a pediatrician to do data entry is not a good idea. Um, it's expensive, and I can hire a lot of data entry people for the cost of 20% of someone's time, particularly if that's a, a fairly high paid position. Um, so the, the, the simple question is, I'm, why, 
what what do you need to do to allow clinicians to answer questions? Some clinicians want to answer the questions themselves, right? They they want they are true clinician researchers. They want to be doing the research. In which case, you figure out how to do that. We have to get them positioned. But most of those positions are going to be positions at uh, at UC Irvine or or other affiliated institutions, right? It's, again, we're a hospital. If you want to do research, you can do research at the hospital. But much of the research that people want to do doesn't need to be done at the hospital and could be done elsewhere. Um, but how? But for the person who just has a question, like I want to answer this question, you know, we're we're good at these. Say I want to answer this question. Let, I will do it, right? Say no, no, you don't do that, right? You're you're way too valuable. You know, you you need to be treating patients. Uh, you're too expensive, and quite frankly, you're probably not trained for it. Um, and and because research training is hard. It's not. I mean, certain. You know, we all understand it, but actually doing it is is hard. And and the doing it isn't just the doing it; it's the design of it. So, so my real approach, and I think there was actually another, another question that was related to this, would, would, you know, how, how do we actually allow people to do this? Let's see, so, so further down, uh, um, somebody was saying, you know, how, how do you, some, for someone who doesn't have the knowledge to build a device, uh, how, do you, how do you do this, right? And I, I'd say that's, that's fine. I mean, that's, I don't think that's the exception. I think that's the rule. I mean, I think most clinicians who have ideas or devices or products have no idea how to design it or implement it or test it. And they shouldn't, they weren't trained in that. Uh, you know, our medical schools will, we spend a lot of time teaching people how to read research, how to understand it, but doing it requires experience and time and, and it's hard. Um, so, so my approach is not, is to say what we want to do is we want to support that. If you have a good idea, it's not a bad idea. It's a good idea. It's a true need. Let's figure out what kind of infrastructure we need to put in place to allow your question to be answered or your need to be resolved um, without you having to do it. And, and I think that that may be actually cheaper and faster and more effective. Now it may involve this whole design innovation process because you may say, you know, I need something that looks like this. And we may say, you need something that does that but it doesn't have to look like that. In fact, there's something else on the shelf over here that if you just bent it this way, you could use it for that. Uh, and, and so sometimes the solution may be something easier than you think, but you still solve the problem. So I wanna be problem focused, right? Not, not person focused as much as problem focused. The people generate the ideas, but we need to think about what resources do we need to solve those problems. And sometimes you do need that person may be the only person who can solve the problem. You better find a way to free up some protected time so they can do the research. But I think in a lot of situations, uh, they don't want to, they're not qualified to, and it's way too expensive. So let's find a different way that gets that problem solved. Uh, and, and, and ultimately, again, it's about health impact, right? It's not about the research itself. It's about using these as techniques to improve the lives and the health of children. Um, and, and so I think, I think that can be done in different ways. So it's, a, anyway, it's, it's sort of a twisted answer to the question, but the question itself presumed a solution. And in the spirit of design thinking, that's only one solution to the problem. Now, um, at biodesign, there's, um, moving on to the next one, at biodesign, there's a structured collaboration between physicians and biomedical engineers. How do you foresee creating this at Chalk? So there's a lot of different ways to do that. I mean, I think this is something that, that George has a sense of as well. I mean, it's, um, you put people together, but I always say that collaboration between two people, there's no such thing as a collaboration between two people. It's always three people. It's the two investigators who don't have time to do the work and the student they hire who actually gets the thing done, right? You, you always need, you have to buy time and, and you don't have time. No, nobody has time. If you have time, it means you're wasting time and, and you know, someone's going to come after you and, and math about that fact. Or you have to do more RVUs or something, right? Nobody has time. You have time, which means you have to buy people. And the cheapest people around are students. So, so the point is that you, you, you leverage that or you buy people. You buy a postdoc, you buy a clinical research coordinator, you pull people in who, who can actually do these things. So to me, it's, you know, how do you create a collaboration? You need to create the the infrastructure and the time and the people and the support that makes collaboration possible. And I can pick up the phone and call anybody and we can have a great conversation and come up with a great idea for a research project. It's never going to happen because nobody has any time on their hands. But if you, if you have a third person on that call who, who actually is like, wait, that's really interesting. I do have time to do this. 
then it may actually happen. I know, George, what, what's your sense of how, when we put people together successfully, how does it happen? I think um, uh, part, I just want to make a distinction because the biodesign program, uh, the original one, those fellows, they, they had all the time. They, they, they were there for the entire year. It was a long time. I, I'm sure you, you know this, Terry. What Terry and I did at USC was let's, let's sort of bake that into the DNA of students. Like they're the ones, students have more time. Now, um, we, there's sometimes you get into trouble with the uh, research advisors who say, where's my student? I say, well, when they come back to you after solving this problem and getting um, awards and innovation and getting, in one case, um, an SBIR, SBIR, uh, SBIR grant, uh, you know, the, the, the professor is like, oh, oh okay. Um, and they, you know, graduated on time in that case. But, uh, but it will sometimes add time to the total training period of the students. But the students who come out there, um, I just got a request today, you know, can you check these, these students who are in your program? And, uh, you know, five of them are getting research distinction. This is research distinction at the, the medical school from uh, uh, the last group that we had. So, but what the point I want to make is that the students have time and they might, and they have the ability to ask um, naive questions. And if they're polite about it and they're eager to learn, they can really sort of um, open a lot of doors. In fact, I'm just going to skip down to another question because someone said, how do you, um, how difficult it is, is it for foundations to in, invest in profit companies? Well, my, you know, one way you could facilitate that is talk about the students who are working on projects in your profit company and let those students apply for, for some funding from the foundations. We had successful um, applications going in for funding for, you know, specific um, foundations, autism foundation, for example. Now, um, George and Terry, this, this is a great one. Can you discuss how you imagine industry can partner with experts at the university or in the hospital to provide domain knowledge? Do you imagine that they may serve as advisors, uh, part-time CMO, or you know, any other roles that you can see? I'll let you take that one, first. Okay, no, uh, uh, I, I, I'm glad we can see the question. Thanks, Sharif, for that question. Uh, and um, my, my answer to that is I think it's an intriguing idea um, because one, you know, to be a part-time chief medical officer, um, uh, it's at least, it's not saying I want to become the CEO of this company because 99.9% .9 of docs should stay away from even thinking about becoming CEOs. Uh, um, their expertise is in the clinical domain and they're wonderful um, clinicians but they can uh, really be supportive of a company that has to have that constant sort of input from the clinical bedside or, or the patient facing experience. And uh, I think that's, that's an important thing to enable. How exactly to enable that? Um, I, again, I would say, you know, involve the clinician with um, intermediaries. Like if you have entrepreneurial lab um, people in the hospital who want to learn more about this, let them step up, let them sort of think, you know, be the um, connective tissue between the, the hospital and, and industry. Um, and let industry in, in ways that um, they'll learn how better to interact with the different um, stakeholders within the hospital environment as well. And I think one of the things we'd like to do at Chalk um, is to facilitate that kind of uh, um, uh, uptake of, uh, of industry partners in, in a way that sort of, you know, uh, diminishes the mystery. I mean, oftentimes we're asked, so like every time I try to connect with a hospital, it's like it's a castle and I can't cross the moat and there's a fire breathing dragon at the door. Um, what, what do I do? Um, and, and, you know, this is a constant question. And we say, well, you know, f uh, find the, the internal champion, look for uh, emerging key opinion leaders, you know, look for the donut shops where they, you know, uh, uh, frequent and start having conversations on a, on a, on a direct level uh, uh, and really sort of work your way in that way. And, and, and 
and part of my role is to teach um, the different stakeholders that I work with, including students, of course, is these skills and how to sort of connect with and uh, be sensitive to um, the variety of different um, dwellers in the innovation ecosystem. And one of the things that I thought was um, implied in, in Sharif's uh, question there, which is, um, I mean, we, we've been talking a lot about how we as a hospital or a university help companies have more impact. But I think one of the things in Sharif's question was about what can we learn from the companies? Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important component of, of sort of to have a little bit of humility here, right? Sort of behind the walls of our ivory tower um, and, and recognize that uh, uh, the companies that are actually out there in the trenches trying to make products, market them, sell them, deal with the regulatory issues, compete in a, in a highly competitive landscape, um, they know stuff about what works. And the, and the companies that are making devices often have their representatives are, are in there working with, with people in the operating room or in the clinic and, and uh, have, have a, a tremendous amount of, of sort of just domain knowledge in these areas, which is very different than the kind of domain knowledge we have. And so I, I think paying attention to that is very important and recognizing that a partnership with industry is, 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 works both ways. And, and that we have opportunities to learn from each other. And, and I think uh, uh, that's, a, that's a very good point that that needs to be baked into uh, whatever agreements or whatever type of uh, arrangement is made as, as a university and a hospital might partner with, with small or large businesses. Yeah, I'll just add that, one, that that's one of the sort of key pieces that I've, I think is so critical in the design thinking process is cultivating that empathy. And as you said, that empathy is uh, omnidirectional. It has to, you know, you, you have to be open to uh, understanding uh, on the corporate, you know, from the hospital side to the corporate side too, the different sort of time pressures, quarterly report kind of environment, you know, all these things that are taken for granted in industry um, that we know nothing about, or like the typical sort of um, healthcare worker um, is, 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 um, is, doesn't know much about it unless they're, you know, married to someone who's very much bringing that home and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and to be open to learning uh, of, from other people's perspectives is essentially what empathy does and what it's a skill that can be uh, trained and built and exercised. And one of the things I enjoy most is helping people with that as well. Great. Now, um, you know, the afternoon wouldn't be complete without talking about artificial intelligence. So how much of it is hype and how much of it is real? So and um, how is chalk applying AI to healthcare? So <laughs> fascinating. Um, so I, I've done a lot of work in, in this field. Uh, back when I started, we didn't call it artificial intelligence. We called it computational neural networks. Um, and then it went through a number. It was called AI back in the 70s and 80s and then came to a, a flaming demise amidst the, uh, the Japanese uh, fifth generation uh, AI project um, and was resurrected uh, uh, about 15, 20 years ago in, in, in concert with the concept of deep learning uh, when, when Jeff, Jeff Hinton uh, came up with that wonderful name um, and uh, revisited uh, a series of old algorithms, some of which he'd been invo involved with, uh, to create the, the, uh, the, the current versions of deep learning algorithms. Um, these are essentially statistical algorithms uh, with uh, some, uh, some degree of sort of an inherent uh, automatic model construction. Uh, and uh, the, this, um, this class of algorithms has uh, tremendous power when presented with enough data. Um, the term artificial intelligence, um, while, while catchy, is, is uh, of course not particularly correct. It wasn't correct when, when Turing and his group coined it, um, and it remains not correct now. Nobody really knows what intelligence is, but whatever it is, it has nothing to do with analyzing you know, billions of pieces of data on the internet and, and using that for something, right? That's not how humans think. Uh, we can learn from single examples. We can make our own inferences about situations we've never seen before. Uh, we, can, we can conduct experiments to figure things out. We build internal models. We build internal models of, of other people. Uh, we, we, the, the 
the level of stuff that real intelligence does is is remarkable by comparison. And they're probably, you know, there, there's it would be hard to imagine an AI program uh, on the earth right now that that has the computational abilities of a fraud. But that said, these are very useful tools, just as statistics is a very useful tool. It's a, it's a statistical technique. It has tremendous power. And, and what, what real, where the power is really coming from is from large data, which is that if you have enough data, um, you know, if you, if you have a big enough hammer, you can crush anything. And if you have enough data, you're going to find the patterns you're looking for. So if you have enough data, you can learn how to translate things and you can learn to play chess and you can learn to uh, do things that look like inferences. Um, and, and so uh, um, there are, uh, there, there's great power to this. It, it's not the same thing as humans, but that's a good thing because we don't need to replace humans. We have lots of humans and it's relatively easy to make more of us. So, so the point is that uh, uh, um, we, what we need are the tools that do the things that we don't do well. And that's when I was talking before about, about uh, how data science can, can augment things. What we don't do, humans absorb a tremendous amount of data, but we're strongly biased in that absorption. Uh, we, we focus on the parts of the data that we think are important. Uh, and uh, there's a recency phenomenon and there's importance phenomena and there's attentional phenomena and there's uh, emotional valence and all of the things that, that make us uniquely human, but that also may lead us to erroneous conclusions. And, and a, uh, uh, a computer that has access to a tremendous amount of data is unlikely to do that. It could do at least a reasonably unbiased estimate of things and, and, and therefore may, may sometimes be able to help us with that and may be able to aggregate types of data that we're not very good at. We're very good at aggregating visual data. We're not very good at aggregating uh, sort of factual symbolic data. We can do it at a much, at a much lower level and a much more simple, um, uh, a, lo a lower density than, than the computers can do. So I think that there's, there's a huge role for, uh, maybe I won't call it artificial intelligence, maybe I'd call it sort of nonlinear statistical uh, techniques uh, in, in augmenting human performance, just the same way as there's a huge role of the internal combustion engine in, in uh, augmenting human performance. Um, and, and so I think it's, it not only is it not going away, I'm very glad it's here. There's many things we couldn't do without it. And every time I use Google Translate or, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with the existence of, the, of these algorithms. Uh, Google Translate is not intelligent. In fact, it makes some hysterical mistakes. Um, but that's okay. Uh, you know, it, it's still, it's a tool and it's a function. And, and uh, so, um, you know, in, in terms of thinking about this, I think this is very important for medicine. I, I, I think what's happening is that we have access to large amounts of data. I, I mean, imagine if right now we had the full genomic data and the full uh, historical, uh, you know, uh, patient experience data and, and medical data and testing data on every patient who, who was infected with uh, COVID-19, right? Um, there are the questions that you want to answer. Uh, is it possible to be reinfected after you've been infected initially? What are the predictors of, uh, of acute respiratory distress syndrome in people who get this? Why don't children get this? Who are, who are the specific risk groups? How fast does it spread uh, depending on uh, the demographics locally or, or depending on population patterns or the existence or lack of public transportation, right? You can answer those questions in a minute, right? So, so these things, if you can, if you have the data available, we now have the, the large data analysis techniques available to do this. We can anything from uh, uh, um, MapReduce uh, type algorithms that allow you to have distributed analysis of large data sets uh, through, again, these sort of uh, nonlinear statistical models uh, that, uh, that allow you to, to uh, uh, sort of automatically determine uh, nonlinear linkages between between different variables. Um, so I, I think uh, um, yeah, it's, it's tremendously valuable. I think we have to recognize what it is, what its limitations are, and what its power is. But it's I think it's it's particularly helpful because it it fills in so many of the gaps that humans themselves are not good at. And and so that's the particular thing you don't nobody you don't want C three PO C three PO is annoying right but you you want the thing you want R two D two right you you want the thing that tells you the answer that fixes your plane for you right you you don't want the thing that sits there and whines like another human in your family right so so the point is you you want that and and I think that's that's really what the promise of of artificial intelligence is. Now, um, I think this will be our last question. Um, it, you know, getting lots of questions through LinkedIn and through the Q&A chat box about, you know, the best way to collaborate with a university like UCI, physicians at UCI, and, or, and like a hospital like Chalk. 
your startup at ULP and you know, how do you go about that collaboration and building that partnership? What is the best avenue to, to approach this, you know, part, seeking a partnership or you know, a collaboration with your organizations respectively? Can I just say, you know, I'll, I'll jump in there because, you know, the answer to that question is really kind of, uh, probably a bespoke kind of situation where you have to tailor the answer to the startup, to the need, to, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and Terry can give an example, a ULP, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Powers, was it? I mean, Chris Hughes. Chris Hughes. I mean, you know, just, just, you know, uh, there's someone, you know, there's a company in ULP, they do stem cell research and, hey, we can connect you with clinicians. Yeah, I think that's, um, it's still a little catch as catch can, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, you happen to make a phone call, you happen to be talking to somebody about their research, you think, oh, wait, <laughs> you know, what if we did this, right? Um, but I think you want to have as much of those sort of serendipitous happenings as possible. And so you want to make it easy. And, and um when I was at Stanford, the, uh, the chair of electrical engineering at the time uh, said to me, you know, my, his, his greatest frustration was he's across the street from the medical center and didn't know how to access it. Um, and, and I mean, by access, you can call, but who do you call and how do you talk to them? And will they pick up the phone and, and what are you asking them for, right? So uh, I, I think making an environment where it's easy to do that, where there's people going back and forth and you know, we, we just, we're just all talking about these things. You have seminars and things like this where we can talk about this and you can have a very mixed uh, type of audience there who can really think about uh, different, ways of, uh, uh, different ways of thinking. And, and, uh, and, and so I think that's, that's basically the main thing is that you, you just have to create that environment. You have, to, you have to train students who can talk both languages. You have to enforce a, uh, a culture of respect. Uh, where uh, uh, people understand that, that uh, we do have different points of view, but that uh, those, those points of view remain uh, really, really quite important. Um, I, was, uh, I, I joke about at a, uh, uh, one of the previous institutions I worked with, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the dean of engineering explained to me how smart the students were and how they could basically learn most of what the medical students knew in a weekend. And then in a subsequent meeting, the dean of the School of Medicine explained to me how smart his students were and how uh, those students could probably learn most of the engineering stuff in a weekend. And I'm just sitting there thinking, good luck, you know. But the point is that you, you have to break that down, right? It has to be each side has to recognize that there is unique expertise on the other side that they don't have. You can read a book, you can Google it, but you can't be it. To be it, you have to do this for a living. It has to be your life. And so uh, if, you, if you meet someone where that other way of thinking is their life, they are valuable. And so you have to create that culture of respect. You have to make it possible for people to talk to each other. You have to embrace the fact that we talk different languages, find a few translators out there. Um, and, and, uh, uh, and then I think you can create this environment. I, I think you can do it. And, and it's, it's not easy, but uh, it, it requires these liaisons. One of the things that's going on now that's wonderful is people like George and I, and we have a couple of uh, uh, open positions being hired where, where people have these dual, they're hired between Children's Orange County and UCI. They have positions on both sides. And I think it's really important to build these people who are the bridges. Uh, that doesn't mean other people can't bridge, but it just you just make more and more and more of that. You, you enforce this idea that, that we have a common goal here. And, and uh, we have different methods, but a common goal. And, 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 and we need both sides. So uh, um, I, I think it's doable, but, but it's, it's a culture change. And it's, uh, it's, it's my favorite uh, uh, term augmented intelligence by having those both those sides you have uh ai um for the service of good uh and uh, i'll remind people that historically that was another uh uh what what ai st stood for from uh, al, al, al mersky's standpoint was augmented intelligence and we can all have a dose of that if we're open to it perfect well um, we just have about two minutes left. Um, if there's anything you guys like to add, um, so um, George or Terry, any final thoughts? Final thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just uh, I want I want to express my excitement about working as at at UCI, be, being a connector between UCI uh, uh, folks at uh, Applied Innovation and Chalk of course, and the medical center. 
And, and I, I think I, the, the same thing, I would echo the excitement. I, I think there's um, the kind of enthusiasm that people have for, for making a difference is, is huge. And, and I feel it's a magnetic pull. I, you know, it's just the, the way in which people want stuff to happen. And, and they make it happen. We have, we have just incredible people in this, in this community. And that means, you know, everybody from, from the research, there's the clinicians, the support people, the parents, the children, the, the community, our, our donors, the, uh, the, the uh, industry partners, uh, organizational groups like ULP, uh, you know, Be All in, Applied Innovation. We have these incredible groups that, that really understand this mission. And, and um, you know, I, I want to focus as much of that as I can, uh, you know, sort of the spotlight on children. But I recognize that, that of course, it's a much bigger light than that. And, and I, I think uh, leveraging what has been learned in many domains, not even health, not just healthcare, um, but to try to think about how do we use all that knowledge and all that energy and all that excitement to improve children's lives. And, and um, I, I think the, the opportunity is amazing. And, and it's, it's just been a pleasure to meet the people I've met and to, and to see how these things go. And this is all very much a work in progress. I mean, you're asking us, you know, what does the hospital of the future look like? Well, I'll tell you when we get there. But, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, but at the same time, uh, um, I, I think the idea that we can work together to create that and so that the, the academic hospital of the future is the correct academic hospital of the future. It's, it's you know, we, we have the right future here. Um, I, I think this is the place to do it. And, and I think we've got a tremendous group of people who are going to make it happen.